the Global Resolution Review, one of the most respected journals on insolvency resolution, has uh, declared India the winner, adjudged India the most advanced nation, the most improved nation for the year 2017-18. A round of applause to Mr. M. S. Sahu, who has spearheaded IBC insolvency resolution in this country. Uh, it's very rare that India has been first, uh, adjudged first in anything legal. So I think this is a, a very important achievement for the country and of course for the uh, Insolvency and uh, Bankruptcy Board of India. Well, uh, Insolvency and Bankruptcy experience so far and the way forward. Uh, clearly by far the most uh, earth shattering, the most uh, uh, scenario changing uh, uh, law that has been uh, passed by the government in the past probably uh, three or four decades. Uh, it's clearly changed uh, the rules of the game when it comes to banking, borrowing, lending and uh, resolution. Uh, uh, we have yet to see the entire impact but uh, first let me look at some numbers. Uh, since the topic says experience so far and way forward, uh, let me just look at the current state of things, some numbers. Uh, we understand that at the moment 4,000 cases are waiting to be heard in the various NCLTs, 11 benches, 1,000 have been admitted, 80 have been closed either by repeal or review, 125 uh, have been gone, gone into liquidation and 40 have been resolved. Uh, that might look a tad uh, uh, not so satisfying considering you're looking at 4,000 waiting to be admitted and 40 resolved. But let me look at the numbers uh, from the point of view of uh, uh, rupees crores. About uh, uh, 55,000 crores were realized by just two cases that were cleared in the first 12 cases sent by the Reserve Bank of India. The total amount uh, which banks have uh, got, which may otherwise have taken many, many years or not at all, uh, that they got from the IBC process is perhaps closer to 1 lakh crore. And uh, some time back somebody even released a number saying that uh, about 86,000 crores has been repaid simply out of fear of NCLT. So if you look at it as almost 2 lakh crore uh, that the banking system has uh, gained which it would have otherwise lost or taken a long time to get back from borrowers, this is a signal and seminal achievement in just about two years of existence. Uh, with these opening words, uh, let me ask my very eminent panel what they make of the experience so far. Well, uh, first up uh, to the author of the uh, entire process itself, uh, Mr. Sahu. How would you sum up the experience so far of the IBBI? I was born into the world of insolvency only after the law was enacted in May 2016. I was born on 1st May. No way I am author of the schemes. I am in charge of implementing some of the processes. I think India didn't have the experience of a Mark incentive led, market led, proactive, time bound insolvency regime. To, in many ways, it was in fact a leap into the unknown. But there is a probably no <coughs> parallel of such swift enactment or implementation of any law either in India or elsewhere. In quickly in two months time, the IBBI was set up on 1st October, by 1st December we had the entire regulatory framework, the entire ecosystem comprising the IBBI, NCLT, IPAs, IPs, everything was in place and transactions could commence in December 2016 and thereafter the information utility has come in. As Lata mentioned, by now we have about 1,000 corporate debtors have been admitted into the resolution process and of them about 150 have been, have concluded the first cycle of it that means they have either ended up with an order for liquidation or for resolution. Today we have about 1,800 insolvency professionals three insolvency professional agencies and in addition to developing and regulating the profession of insolvency professional, another component, another key profession which is important in the insolvency process is called the registered failure. The process for developing and regulating that process has also begun and that responsibility has been given to the IBBI. 
So we have also six registered failure organizations. Examinations are on for insolvency professionals as well as three disciplines of valuation profession. And hopefully we will soon have a well-regulated, accountable valuation profession. The work has begun in the front of individual insolvency. The work has also begun on cross-border insolvency. And we find there is all-round enthusiasm among all the stakeholders. Whatever progress has happened so far is on account of the stakeholders who could make it a reform of the stakeholders, by the stakeholders, and, and for the stakeholders. And you know if it is by them, it never perishes. Uh, Bairam, uh, tell us. I mean, clearly there are capacity constraints. Uh, what would you identify as uh, the way forward in terms of capacity constraint? All of us were very, very surprised. Uh, judiciary is always blamed for delays, and uh, in many cases, rightly so. But this time, whether it's NCLT, Appellate, High Court, Supreme Court, everyone, I'm sure you'll agree, has uh, surprised on the positive side. The things have moved much faster than we expected. Will that continue as the numbers, because the pipeline is growing. Yes. The first 12 were admitted within four weeks. The next 25 took, you know, almost three, four months. So uh, do we need more NCLTs? We've got three that have just uh, come into play. I think we need at least five, six more. At the appellate level also, we can't create a choke. But the nice thing, why we have achieved this is it shows that when all the arms of the government are united in succeeding, uh, how fast and efficiently we can move. So I continue to remain positive. The other... Uh, At a minimum, how many more NCLT benches do we need? No, I think Dr. Sahu will have a better sense of that. But I would say three and at least another three, minimum. And at least another appellate tribunal, if not two more, otherwise you'll choke at the appellate level. Because beyond a point, the High Court, Supreme Courts are not going to keep prioritizing us. They realize it's a very, very crucial issue because without the credit flows, you won't get GDP growth. All of us are very keen on growth. So everyone realizes this is needed, but we have to help the process. And the other one, which I think uh, Dr. Sahu will give us good news on that, is that I'm worried, uh, being a lawyer, that there should not be judicial creep. You know, the architecture of the law is very clear that commercial decisions, whether you like it or not, with the COC, they are best place to make it. And certainly lawyers are not uh, the best guys to decide or the judiciary commercial aspects. So I hope they don't get into that. All right. Uh, oh, uh, Abhizar, what about uh, uh, RPs? Uh, have you found enough talent in RPs or is that a constraint? First of all, unfair. Is that a conflicted question? I, I am the only one on this dais with my regulator sitting next to me. So please spare me that. <laughs> but but, uh, but uh, to Can tell I you... the question to someone else, then who will be else. more critical about it? Okay. No, no. I think, frankly, uh, we have 1,800 RPs. That's a good thing. Uh, do RPs need continuous education? Yes. Is there anyone qualified enough to provide them continued education? It's only going to be the people who experience it. So I think this is a build-up that will happen as we gain more experiences. Uh, what we do, and I'm sure most others do, is that, and by the way, we even do it with competing RP firms. We actually share information on what is happening on respective cases. And that's, I think, that's the only way one can build. Now, I think uh, I take one point which I think IBBI is trying to press quite significantly and I am a firm believer of that, is we should increasingly form more and more platforms. This is not an individual show. It has to be a platform with varied skills which actually enables a turnaround of a company or a better sale or better realization for the banks. Uh, let me come directly now to the uh, problems that uh, you all have encountered in the process of resolving some cases, mostly group companies. Uh, Sumans, to you that. A lot of the, uh, uh, not a lot, quite a few of the companies that have been taken to NCLT are, uh, 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 are structured in such a way that many of their activities are in various uh, entities which are located in the jurisdiction of various NCLTs. Mm -hmm. uh, is this a problem uh, that can be solved at the RP level and the committee of creditors level or do you need a change in the law? 
Well, I think partly it requires a change in the law, but I must say that, you know, probably this area could have been examined better than what it uh, was done by, by those who worked at the BLRC or otherwise, but no offense meant, uh, because, uh, because uh, you know, we, we do understand that there are two layers of treatments that the, that the group companies require. One is the group of companies that are insolvent technically or legally, and those companies that are not insolvent, but without which a proper group restructuring would not be possible, and therefore you may need to pull them into insolvency. The first one is the simplest one, where because the law says that there's a default of one lakh rupees, then you are insolvent, and then what you do is you, you, you basically try to combine them into one package, which currently is, is not possible because you need to go to different NCLTs. The companies are registered in different jurisdictions territorially. You may end up having different resolution professionals appointed in them. They may start going into different directions and start following their own individual processes. And there is no coherence and there's no complementary process and eventually you would lose value of the process. The whole idea of the would, insolvency... Would you like some rules yes. written on Yes, this? we have already brought it to the attention of the policy makers that these are some changes that are required to be made in the law. But that may take its own time. Policy makers think in their own way, holistically. Uh, but I do believe that within the policy framework, legislative framework that is available today, it is possible for the RPs to innovate and be creative and do as much as possible in order to preserve value. Mr. Sahu, do laws or regulations or directives need to be written? I am not too sure, as Mr. Batra told, we are willing to rewrite the regulations as and when we face a, face a difficulty. But in this case, you don't think you can facilitate uh, uh, by giving some directive that if it is a group company, you have uh, IPs who are... Uh, uh... No, I don't think IPE addresses this problem, in fact. Uh, in fact, the IPE is not authorized to take up an assignment. It is Mr. X who takes an assignment and I think it's a, somewhere I heard that some people are empanelling the IPEs. That's not a good practice. Okay. I would discourage banks to, to refrain from doing that and also IPEs to get into this kind of a game. But obviously, the group companies need a little special treatment mm -hmm. and we'd be happy to address that.